Now in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be seated. <laughs> there is a field on the other side of your best efforts and your worst fears, a place where your diligent effort is in fact meaningless, a place of failure, a place of loss. It's a dry place dotted with despairing souls like Job, Elijah, Jesus in his 40 days. You'll find there the wandering, hungry ghosts, the insane, the alone, those who find it impossible to find hope. I'm talking, of course, about the land of the lost, a land familiar to most of us. We've either been there ourselves or we have been touched by the lives of those who have. It's a place of despair, of depression, of suicide. What does it taste like, that dry dirt of that desert land? Elijah gives us a hint in his despair, fleeing from the authorities of the king, fleeing from his own death, he finds nothing but despair as he sits under that broom tree, perhaps hoping that death will sweep all his troubles away like so many brooms. But God has other plans for him. The question comes again and again, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? There is a forest in Japan called Ekigoara, which is at the base of Mount Fuji. It's a famous place because it's one of the most popular suicide spots in the world. In 2002, there were 78 completed suicides on that spot. Another 83 people were apprehended by the local authorities who, uh, who go back and forth in the forest looking for these lost souls. It's sometimes called the Sea of Trees because they're so dense, the trees, that it blocks out all the sound. It's a very, very quiet place. Japan has a suicide problem. That's perhaps not surprising given the culture that is uh, so based on shame and, and honor and this idea that you can restore your honor by committing suicide is a gracious way out. It's actually not the highest suicide rate in the world. That honor belongs to Greenland, where 108 people out of 100,000 commit suicide every year. 108. The U.S. is more like 12. In Canada, it's about 11 and a half. Japan, however, is twice that. 21.7 suicides out of 100,000 people per year. And it's been rising since the 90s. People blame all kinds of things besides the cultural factors. There's also the fact that uh, the recession has hit people. Uh, there's a lot of other things that are going on culturally that people have pointed to. And in general, it's a culture which has uh, not really spoken honestly about the problem of suicide. Into that cultural mix, a monk has stepped in. His name is Etiu Nomoto. Uh, there's an article about him in The New Yorker uh, this last week. And uh, he's kind of a reluctant uh, spokesman for this issue. He kind of came about it because he was just a, a temple priest doing his business, doing a lot of funerals and weddings and things like that. But people started coming to him with their problems, and there were a lot of them. And after a while, he founded a website, and he started to reach out to these people. And then he got burned out on that, and then he figured out a new way of doing it, and he's ha been a speaker, and he's had a lot of influence. And I think in him, we see something of God's grace, reaching out to those who are lost in that land of the Sea of Trees. No doubt, if he were there with Elijah, he would have tapped him on the shoulder, given him some bread, and told him to walk. He is a Zen monk, after all, and he believes in hard work. So <laughs> these days, in fact, uh, to get treatment from him, you have to go to his monastery, which is in a very rural place, and it's actually both expensive and difficult to get to. But he believes that's the only way that he can sort out the people that are actually willing to work on their issues and try to find healing. But I have good news for you. Jesus journeys into these regions which are beyond, these lands of the lost. In the story we have today, he travels across the lake through a nasty storm, which of course he silences in that famous scene, to the land of the Gerasenes, where they're tending pigs. This is Gentile territory. This is a dangerous place for Jesus to be, and he immediately disrupts everything about it, including bringing healing to a chronically ill man. It doesn't actually matter for us whether we want to insist that he had a, a psychological ailment like schizophrenia or whether he was in fact possessed by demons. It really doesn't matter for the story, and Luke wouldn't have seen any difference at all. The fact is, this man, chronically ill, was unbindable. He wandered in the land of the lost among the tombs and the emptiness. To get there, Jesus had to brave a storm, and he leaves one in his wake as well, showing how healing is often disruptive to the community norms. But he does go there. Like the angel in Elijah's story, he does go to that place and he does touch this man and he does bring healing. I want to tell you another story about a Japanese healer. He came into a place that was seemingly lost, a place full of despair. His name is uh, Muninori Kawasaki. Uh, if you're a Blue Jays fan, you know that we started the season with great hopes. 
and those hopes became full of despair. And many fans, such as myself, wandered a lost land of, of despair. And one of the key players for the Blue Jays, uh, Jose Reyes, uh, first uh, the shortstop, was injured. And so they had to call in a, uh, a man from the minor leagues, this, this Japanese guy, Muninori Kawasaki, who barely has any English, by the way. And he's not what you would think of as a great baseball player. He's not a particularly good batter. He's not a particularly good thrower. Uh, he can catch well. Everybody gives him that credit. But he's not a strong guy. He's not a, necessarily the kind of athlete we think of as leading our teams to victory. But since he joined the Blue Jays about two months ago, a remarkable thing has happened. They've turned it around. They've just won their last 10 straight games in a row. And a lot of it is because of something magical that this guy has brought to this team. And no one can really identify what it is. And they've struggled with words, some, you know, je ne sais quoi, or, or you know, he, he brings some sort of charisma or, or something. People say partly it's his uh, fearless joy. It's the way that he always congratulates everyone. He's always giving high fives even to the position players who hadn't made a play in that inning. He'll still give them a, a high five and cheer them on. Most of the time they can't understand what he's saying, but it's in fast Japanese and he seems enthusiastic. So on Saturday we were playing Baltimore. We were behind four to six and it looked like that winning streak was in jeopardy. Kawasaki came to the plate and people got excited because they really liked this guy. He's a really charming, nice guy. I mean, he's just the quintessential nice guy. So he gets up there, and something remarkable happened. He hit a home run, the first in his career as a major league baseball player. <laughs> in fact, he's the oldest Blue Jays player in history ever to score their first home run. <laughs> like I said, we were losing four to six. His critical uh, score brought in another uh, runner, so it tied the game, and then another player was able to score one, so he won against Baltimore seven to six. But that moment when he scored that home run, uh, I don't know if any of you watched that game, but the entire Rogers Center went bananas. They went bananas. They cheered this guy. And after he ran the bases, he did his trademark bow to the crowd, and it was just, it was beautiful. I mean, people were clapping him on the back. People were crying. I mean, it was, it was crazy. I tell that story because there's something about what this man is doing when he goes to this land of the lost, which has a transformative impact. And it's not because his personal efforts were so extraordinary, but it was something about the quality of relationship that he brought to that team. And I think that quality of relationship is simply love. He loved his teammates. He loved them. And that had a healing impact on that entire team and changed the whole organizational culture to one of winning. And also, by the way, of joy. They look like they're having fun. Did Jesus have love for the demoniac? Of course he did. He went to this place, this dark place of tombs and caves and pigs, and he was able to bring healing with his love. He touched this man and he healed him. Interestingly, when this man wants to join Jesus and go with him on the boat, Jesus says, no, no, return to your community and tell the good news. That's very interesting because it says something about what we're to do, by the way, that we're somehow to stay in our communities and tell the good news. What about Elijah? Did he experience God's love? Of course. Though it probably felt more like the, the smack of the Zen teacher's uh, stick than it did like uh, the sort of loving hand and loaf of bread. But yes, he experiences God's love too in the form of revelation and of wisdom. So what are we to do with this? I think that we are to have good courage and to go to these lands of the lost, to have the courage to go to these places of darkness where people dwell, places where people feel depressed and suicidal or hurt or injured in any way, to go into those lands of the lost and touch people with a similar kind of joyful love that these people have shown us how to enact. Because there is a field on the other side of the lake, a field where our best and most diligent efforts will be meaningless, but God's love is not. And it has a power to bring healing and restoration to all whom it touches. Amen. So as we usually do, I'll open this up if anyone has any comments. Or